Purple Voices Flash section. Um, today we're going to talk about threats to individuals who are expressing themselves online. And um, we were given the session very last minute, so what we decided to do was just try to have a conversation with anybody who wanted to join us. So I'd love it if those who are towards the back want to come to the front. Um, just make it easier. We might not even need to use the mics, but. So just to give those of you who aren't familiar with us a little introduction, um, Global Voices is an international network of writers, bloggers, and leaders. Um, we have contributors in 130 countries. There are 1,300 of us. Um, we write about all kinds of things on our site, and we use the internet as sort of the main bed of our sources. So we are pulling um, conversations from Twitter, Facebook, other social media platforms, quotes from bloggers, video, photography, and the kind of the special benefit that we feel like we bring as a media network is that all of our authors are writing about the country that they're either that they're from or that they live in. And they generally know these um, online speakers and uh, video access photographers, etc. They know that these networks, they sort of can break down um, a controversy or an event in a specific place um, in a sort of detailed and context conscious way that a foreign correspondent might not be able to. So that's sort of what we feel like is this added value that we bring to the internet media landscape. Um, the other thing that we do is translate, and we have 100, uh, sorry. 30 different uh, sites in different languages. So you'll find our content in Spanish, Arabic, Portuguese, Malagasy, Korean, and other languages. Hisham and I are, uh, we run the Advocacy Project, which is a branch of the network that focuses on digital rights challenges. Um, and this, we sort of started this project five years ago when many members of our community started to experience uh, threats and challenges because of what they were doing online. And this is, I think, you know, a thing that kind of brings many people here to IGF, right? That um, bloggers not only were seeing, uh, having attacks and sort of challenges on their sites and online, but also experiencing legal threats um, and extrajudicial threats and harassment. Um, and we've been through many cases uh, in our own community of people really facing threats in their lives, um, prison, you know, sort of the, the full range. And so we've actually we started also what you can see up here, which is the Threat and Voices Project, where we've collected through crowdsourcing and also just through our own community um, cases of bloggers or what we started to call online speakers have a lot of different kinds of people um, that we cover who have been threatened in some way. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. And we're, we are just coming out of um, having dealt with what for Hisham and I in our somewhat new roles in this project um, was our first experience with trying to help one of our community members. Um, an author of ours who lives in Bahrain, a uh, 26-year-old IT guy turned activist journalist, was um, arrested on July 31st, and essentially for doing activism, criticizing the government, those kind of usual things. Um, and his lawyer was arrested a week later, so he and, and essentially forbidden from defending him. So we. We're left in the situation where we had to figure out how are we going to help this person? He's not a super well-known 
writer, um, and he doesn't have a huge network of contacts or allies that might be able to help him. So we started out by trying to move through back channels, work with government contacts to see if we could get help there. Um, that didn't get us very far. So then sort of went the public route. Um, did Twitter campaign, press release, tried to interest other bigger media in covering the story. Um, we <laughs> approached Dan Rather, who had done a piece in Bahrain where um, Safi Mohammed had helped him and his crew while they were there, and they actually ended up interviewing him. The story was super interesting. We tried to get Dan Rather's help. Not much help there. Um, in the end, we did not get a whole lot of help from the people that we reached out to. Not from big media, not from um, legal advocacy groups. And the feeling with media was that it wasn't a compelling enough story. Like, this is Bahrain, this happened. So if there was something special, maybe, but it, it wasn't enough. Um, and then with our sort of legal expert advocate contact, a lot of them said, this isn't a case that we think we could, you know, this wouldn't make bigger policy progress for us. It's a, sort of not, not quite worth the effort. Um, there's a, you know, a feeling that Bahrain is, is a lost cause. So I guess the question that we kind of want to pose to all of you is like, what do we do about this? Because it feels like there is, in the policy expert advocacy community, there is this everybody is working around human rights. That's what everybody talks about. Um, and they talk about what they do. And yet, the, there are all of these individual cases, all these human beings who aren't quite, like, how do we reach these cases? How do we um, help these people more? And what can Global Voices kind of do to work with expert communities and with other communities to try to change this dynamic? Um, I want to just hand it over to Hisham Elmiran. It's great your colleague here um, to say just a little bit more, and then we'll open it up for a discussion. Thank you, Adri. Um, I'm going to be very short, and, and uh, I, I guess I want to share with you our struggles uh, in terms of being, you know, uh, we've been in, in that uh, space for a long time now. So, what we have started in 2005 as a as an idea in a workshop, uh, and the, the idea was to create an alternative uh, media that speaks uh, for internet users, uh, and from their perspective, and it slowly, you know, uh, evolved to become uh, also an advocacy group uh, that is struggling to uh, raise awareness and shed some light on those uh, little stories of unknown people who are being harassed, arrested, and killed in countries because of content they create on they create online. So I guess uh, we are here at the ITF. Uh, well, we, we, we brought a lot of questions uh, uh, and a couple of answers as well. But, uh, it's more about how to build and sustain a network of users because the feeling is that the, 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 the so-called battle for free internet is looks more and more as a lost battle. Uh, I mean, you have a lot of stakeholders, and it's very asymmetrical. Governments are very powerful, are very rich. Corporations are very powerful, very rich. The convention, the convention tools, uh, liberation technology doesn't work all the time. Uh, more people are being exposed. Surveillance is life. Uh, but we believe that the engagement as we discussed uh, yesterday, is can be useful, engagement with government, and corporations, etc. But there is also a need for a, a community uh, of practice and a coalition uh, between those users. Uh, it, I mean, as far as uh, activists and as far as users, um, I mean, the feeling is that it's our our interests have captured. The discourse is not intelligible. And most of the time, that you have competing groups uh, that struggle to articulate a strong argument. And 
face of the community of uh, you know corporations and even technical the technical community who have the power and also the expertise to articulate very intelligent and powerful arguments. Uh, we think that a project like Threatened Voices is one answer among many. Uh, we've met recently in Morocco with a would-be coalition of, of right groups, uh, usual suspects, CPJ, Amnesty, uh, and others, uh, the UNESCO as well, which supported us. And the idea is to document those cases where internet user rights are threatened or violated, and maybe also take them to the next level where we can use that data to advocate for uh, internet user rights. So we're probably going to open the floor to you guys uh, and see what I, I mean, uh, we would love to, to hear your experiences uh, and whether you think that you can help us uh, in that uh, struggle, that is most of the time it's really painful and difficult to, to convey into action. I mean, I'd be curious to hear from, I know there are a couple of experienced policy advocates here, so I'd be curious to hear from you guys, like, what do you think about this? Do you have a time when you were trying to pick, you know, your more specific path in this field and kind of wonder, like, should I, should I focus on trying to change policy that will affect a lot of people, or what if I just focus on individual cases? If that was a decision that you made at some point, that would be interesting to hear about. My name is Jorge Di Sierra, I am an I international investor in international delegation. I work in Mexico. And um, Blue House is the person that's going to make the call. The question is uh, how we can train and support uh, citizens using social media to report crime and corruption in Mexico. And Blue House is working at two levels. One is in passing policy at the national level how to put the governmental mechanism to protect your medical workers. And I am working on the ground, training the foreign citizens uh, from all over the country. So we have the two, the two tracks working uh, together at the same time in Mexico. But my question to you is that I have seen several cases from Mexico and from Latin America on the website, but some information seems to be not updated. Um, you don't have all the cases. Um, my question is how how we can make the most important cases to appear on the website, and how to make connections with you in order to, to have a better visibility of uh, important cases in Mexico, Central America, and other countries. That's a great question. So one of the challenges with the Threat Voices platform is that it's crowdsourced, and that in the end has and it's a it has a lot of technical uh, problems, right? and we have ended up with a sort of not great data set. And Mexico is a place where, I mean, we could have probably five or six times the cases that we do um, if it were fully updated. Part of the challenge is that we have our authors in Mexico have stopped writing about Mexico, um, and it is left and have sort of stopped touching these issues because they're scared. And this has left us actually with bad data. Um, so one of the things that we're we are working to do is actually develop some formal partnerships and get some funding for the site. The site's never had any funding, so it's sort of been a, kind of it was a great idea, but a project that ultimately, like you said, just does not have um, 
we don't have everything that we need. And we sort of need help from everybody. Um, but it would be great if we could talk afterwards, actually, about how we can work together on that. I'll leave. I come from a journalistic background, so, you know, with hopefully somebody else in the potential of arrest or threat and so forth. Um, but I would imagine that the Internet actually gives us a huge new opportunity, which is the potential of remaining anonymous. And, and if that could leverage, be leveraged perhaps by expanding the tools that allow your contributors to sensibly try to, as much as possible, remain anonymous. And this is uh, a challenge, I understand. But I would say that uh, in many cases, countries like Bahrain will, you know, take all the, I mean, will go to the very end to, in order to you know, suppress the opinion. And it might be too late if a person gets arrested. I mean, there are obviously one needs not to be told. Uh, however, if in those cases, it might be even better if one could try to prevent the action itself from happening. So uh, the uh, number of measures that I would suggest is uh, an extensive, comprehensive guide for all of those contributors to uh, uh, learn uh, issues such as the use of the for among uh, software and potential uh, safety measures in terms of collecting interesting data and ensuring that their you know, devices are always uh, uh, stored in a safe place uh, or uh, and us being encrypted and a number of other measures uh, and also that would also be important for their sources because oftentimes you can end up uh, not only threatening yourself but also the sources that you have met. So it's a combination of things I would uh, imagine. It's not easy but it can be done I know. and I know others are working on these things. So it could be useful to think in that new direction. Absolutely. Security is something that we're working on constantly. And it's actually difficult with our community because we aren't together. And people have really different ideas about what kinds of threats they might be facing. It's hard to, like we were talking about last week, it's sometimes it's actually hard to know what kinds of risks you're taking. And that impacts the decisions that people make about how they protect their information, but absolutely true that there's, there's a lot that we can do um, in that way. This is an interesting tool. Is there any more that we have to go of the cases? What can you put out there and, and why is there the level of individual management that I think you will be able to talk in a little bit about? Um, are there cases you wouldn't put up there? Or are you more, once you're arrested, the case is public, it goes up, and that's where the advocacy of it comes? So as far as the methodology goes, we're actually, the methodology for the site was never really thought, it was not kind of thought out in a long-term sense. And so, um, so that's something that we're working but in terms of what kinds of cases go up, there's, there are some boundaries around um, who are the types of people that we report on. And there's, there's kind of blurry lines at the edges. Um, but it is, the, I think, sort of the core group is bloggers, um, online speakers who don't belong to a big media company or some big institution that one sort of will support them and to you know kind of probably fall into a different category in terms of the kind of expression they're doing. So uh, but there's a there are a lot of fringe cases we can talk about. The other thing though that might be more what you're asking about is um, how how do we decide that information should be put on the site that's made public? That's actually the, that's the one thing that we do have a pretty good community vetting process. So Many of the cases up there are of people that we know or that our authors know. And so we've been able to work together to actually, you know, talk to a family member, talk to the person's attorney if they have one, and 
make sure that this is safe and okay to make this public. Um, so that's a, I mean, that, that I think is the strength of the project is that there are actually, you know, human rights groups that have great intentions that will make information public when they don't know that that's safe or okay for the person that they're writing about. Um, we have, we're aware of how dangerous that can be and what kinds of consequences it can lead to. So that's, I mean, that's one thing that's made, probably made it harder to add some cases to the site is that we just can't, as much as we think it probably would be good to put it up there, we do not 100% know that it's okay. And so we will not. Hi. Um, looking from the policy side, so you were asking what the policy people, how the policy people could be in your I got your, or I know. And I think that maybe what can be useful is for people who are working on different countries and who are facing the threat to actually um, uh, tell or suggest uh, the policy people what to do because uh, it's really hard many times for us um, to kind of make that insight that link. I mean, we do have partners and work with people that are working in these countries where the situation is complicated, but sometimes uh, they have. I don't know, for example, a Korean saying, okay, this like policy or international legislation passed, then it's easier for us to do this. Or, so I think maybe it could uh, be useful if other uh, people here maybe can share what kind of thing would be useful for them. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I have hoped that we can do. I mean, Global Voices were sort of community of individuals that could probably give a lot of input, tell a lot of stories to groups like APC or others that have a lot of um, knowledge and actually sort of power and leverage in policy making spaces that we don't, um, but probably don't have as many stories or examples that, as we can provide. I mean, it's something, I don't know, that I would be interested in trying to see if there's actually, uh, should we do a meeting or or something to kind of get to get that started to kind of I don't know build and because in a way it's about building a stronger kind of um, tradition or norm of talking to each other you know Very, very good. But uh, uh, I was just thinking if you already have looked into uh, some of the systems of the um, monitoring and documenting certain rights violations in more detail. Um, maybe you did this already, uh, and, and other purposes, because maybe this is the purpose just to put this information online uh, or uh, visible to of other, uh, other, uh, other um, way of. documentation of, of the events of, uh, of certain violations and then this could be uh, communicated also nationally through some legal aid organization that could do some legal assistance to this, these cases. So you can do both ways have some cases that are visible and uh, in some cases that you can accept by taking the legal steps at the national level or I mean, one of the things, so we have, um, Friend Voices is, is a, sort of an offshoot of our, our main project site, the advocacy site, and there, so like Muhammad's case, you can find five or six articles on the site about him, about kind of what kind of work he was doing, what specifically happened, um, that we could confirm, which is, um, and campaign letters, um, 
press release and things like that. But it's, it is, we sort of, we have a lot of technical challenges and that one of them is to sort of link up and bring all of that stuff together. What organization did you say you work with and where are you working? I'm from Azerbaijan, I'm the governor of the journalist, and I'm here with the Freedom House delegation. Um, I think I have a similar question to the question raised by Jorge from Mexico about the update. Um, like I just checked the Threatened Voices Azerbaijan page, and um, there is the unupdated information about one of the activists was actually released a while ago, um, and there is nothing else about the very recent arrest um, of youth activists and bloggers. And so my question is, um, how do you make sure that the information is updated and on what basis do you have? I know that for Global Voice, they used to write for Global Voices, that they're a regional editor to collect information. But even the GZ as a Rajani um, country page is still not updated. Like one of the recent places was from like early, early 2013. Um, so what's the, how do you deal with that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the, the challenge of the volunteer network, right? Like we have, you know, there are a lot of countries in the world, and it's, 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 we have these great teams in certain places that keep them incredibly well updated, and then, like, Azerbaijan, I mean, Central Asia in general, we really, we've got a few really strong people, but people come and go, and um, it's just, it is a real challenge. One good thing about Gun Voices is that you actually can, anybody can submit a page. So if you have it and you have the time to get um, it would be wonderful you can do that. And then actually uh, another issue for us there is that we don't have, like, maybe I can chat with you afterwards. As far as the verification process goes, I think we sort of, with the countries where we don't have strong teams, we end up sort of super challenged in posting information because we don't feel confident in the network that we have in so far as the verification um, aspect of it. We might have information we're kind of holding. Um, but yeah, it's, we're, we are like aware of all of the things that we haven't been able to do on this. And part of what's going to hopefully happen in the next year is we'll actually get some funding and some bigger institutional partners that can help us fill in all these gaps and, and make the updates to get sort of to see what people end up being under arrest for years for some people with the updates. Yeah. I may just add very quickly. I mean, it's, it's a fundamental question that has been constant up for quite a while. Part of the answer is to get more money to be able to hire people to take care of the website 24-7. And this is a really a challenge that speaks of the bigger picture, which is that we are we don't have the resources to keep up with those all those overwhelming questions. Uh, uh, again, people uh, what we consider voices are people who use the internet for citizenship in the larger situation. You know, to be political to be other but I think that documenting those threats is the first step before you, you know, you, you go beyond and do advocacy, you do advocacy work, and from that extension, it's a meaningful action. So, money is good, but it's probably not enough. And I think that the ultimate response or the ultimate solution is all of us. I mean, this is not our property, actually. This is just a platform that we put out there, hoping that people can come together come forward and use it. So you can own this thing. You can hack it if you want. And if you think that there are things that are not yeah. If you think that there are things that don't make don't don't make sense, so that platform is very open. And this is the purpose of this workshop is to have your feedback and also hopefully have your support and probably join us in owning this refreshing 
content um, and really going with uh, the idea of crowdsourcing, but not just working with digital activists and um, people who consider themselves um, digital rights netizens, but uh, working with the prisoners' families, like reaching out to stakeholders who would want that information updated. And you know, this might require less funding because they are actually acting on their own interests. You know, the family members or close friends wouldn't necessarily need that. So somehow coming up with a way where um, ownership is is identified, and so when information um, becomes available, um, you know, somebody's going to hold it accountable to so, so that. Kind of thing. I think that this is, and you guys have recognized it, such a, an important element because it speaks to the sustainability and the enduring uh, of projects like this. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's not just obviously the digital rights and the medicine issue, it's also political prisoners across the spectrum. And so that's something that maybe some cross pollination with uh, traditional civil and political activists um, could also be successful. Even the issues of Indonesia, maybe Malaysia won't have issues that happen in Indonesia, so Indonesia and just on this way. Unless we have a network to the Indonesian civil society and the Jewish civil society for example. That's how I think I just is a platform to make the connection with the different civil society and stakeholders um, to make this thing. I'm 
embarrassed because I was going to say, wouldn't it be so cool to do something with all the people in, in this room around you know, kids' lives and around um, the Threatened Voices campaign for Block Action Day, but it was just last week. Um, but it kind of speaks to a different idea and that this initiative, I think, had a lot of novelty and it got a lot of you know, kind of attention when it launched and um, it, its newness, existence itself was uh, kind of a, a self sustaining um, advocacy initiative for a while. But then, of course, that fades away. And so, how can you plug into either other new initiatives and become something of a um, like a shepherd for you know spotlighting new things and, and really becoming um, the authoritative voice on something to pay attention to. And, um, I think that's sort of what you already do, but if you uh, would come up with some uh, landing pages that will explain how anybody who wants to start up and have the initiative can come to you for that uh, megaphone, that that magnifying glass. Um, you know, that gives you kind of this feel of this is the cool thing that we found and everybody comes to you every day to see, well, you know, what's the iPod going to go to today? So that's one thing. And then another is looking at these big, overarching global um, uh, needs. So the Millennium Development Goals coming up in 2015. Uh, how can, I mean, these very, very important issues about development, about you know, rights, dealing with access, uh, how could those be linked to these more um, kind of first generation rights? You know, because you need the second generation rights, you need the third generation rights, but at the end of the day, if you don't have these first rights, if you're being violated by, um, by what you highlight, um, or the violations of what the work is highlighting, that can become another way that you insert yourself into the video. And, um, you know, then carry yourself beyond this kind of you know, novel, um, digital rights campaigning to a more authoritative voice on, on the fundamental rights that are going to uh, crystallize in the global consciousness soon. Right now it's really, I think, a lot of um, individuals who are more, you know, really into the human rights for generation. without even having the branding or the bureaucracy of having uh, partnership. I represent an organization called Willoughby. There are three organizations working in the business space in Pakistan, which is Fight for All, Willoughby, as well as the Civil Rights Foundation. Nearly uh, all three have representation at the, at the global versus ad hoc community. And we often write about our projects, the projects that you know, Fight for All or Willoughby or DRF might be working on. And uh, we provide, and we have the freedom to provide that, you know, that content. And I think that, um, I mean, I don't think that any anyone in this group that, that wants to provide or remove information that's already on the Threatened Voices website or Xbox website needs to worry about any kind of partnership. It's a, it's a pretty open platform. And uh, as someone who's been a part of it uh, for some time now, I think that it is as simple as sending an email to Elwood or sending an email to Sham and come on board and go ahead and improvise it. And, and the real beauty of a DVO or is, has been the fact that uh, there's authentic reporting because there are actual people on the ground that have been working on these issues then reporting on it. And that's, that's what keeps it going and that's the only way that it can be. And now the recruiting shall end. Um, well, I think it's actually about time for us to wrap up, but there have been a number of people that they talk afterwards, so um, why don't, unless anybody else has a note or comment, um, I will invite you all to come up and maybe we'll 
kibble out. If, I'm not sure if there's a message coming in. But, um, and continue the conversation without microphone.